Legends from the Hills. Welcome back to the Old History Project. Before we dig into this mystery, let me first remind you guys that I have a shop set up where you can support your favorite historian. And because these stories are obscure and only told by word of mouth, I try to be as factual as possible when researching them. Also, because there is not an abundance of pictures in relation to this material, I took and clipped my video from my Bridgeport, my Bridgeport Forgotten Community video. And so that's what you'll be seeing, and when the time comes, I'll insert the only pictures that I have. I feel that this video suits the aesthetic, so please like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy. Now the video may come across as short, or the stories may come across as short, but let me just remind you that some of the facts and some of the parts of the stories have been forgotten over the years. I may make this a small series for the next little while while we wait for my next adventure. Now, for those of you not from the Appalachian region, there are just some places that you just don't venture into, unless you know someone. We call some of them hollers. And usually everyone in a holler will know you're coming before you even turn on the road. For instance, Billy has done called Johnny, and Johnny's done called Paul, and they're all watching you to see if they know you, and they likely already have a plan to deal with you. And they get really ill when you walk up under moonshine steel too. I'm kidding, but sort of. See, in some parts of Appalachia, there are places that are so rural, so far out there that the police could be 30, 40, even an hour plus away. And you have to turn to thy neighbor for help. Which was the case in most of the small mountain towns, such as Eola, Kentucky, Del Rio, or Fork Mountain, Tennessee. Somewhere like that. And there are places that are even more rural than those places. This first story revolves around a little-known serial killer known sparsely as Mountain Mall. Mountain Mall, or as the government knew her, Minnie Sutton, was born in Haywood County, North Carolina, but lived in a small town just outside of Del Rio, Tennessee, called Westmar. She was married twice and had three kids from her first marriage, Elizabeth Kenneth and Maydeen. I was made aware of this mountain mall from a guy I worked with who was from Cosby. Now, I love a good story, especially a good history story. The fact that this is a murder mystery only adds to the flavor. I spent a good deal of time trying to find anything about her, but nothing was written online other than an article that recorded special families of the Appalachian region, the Smoky Mountains. The Suttons are one of those such families. I made a couple of posts to Facebook, and boy, as soon as I did, these stories come pouring in. Stories about Mountain Mall were all over the place in this comment section, and some commented that she was just a scary story to keep kids from wandering off. A common theme that was told was that she'll get you good and dead. A former school teacher, uh, Phyllis Teague McCurry, messaged me and mentioned that she was teaching elementary school classes in the mid to late 60s and her kids even then were talking about a mountain mall and that her family had mentioned a mean old lady named Minnie Sutton. Now she didn't remember Minnie, much about her anyway, but she did know that she lived in what was known as West Mar. She did also mention that West Mar in its day was a pretty lawless place and that no good cop would go up there for a period of time. It was mentioned that lots of gambling, murder, and other acts went on down there, which is a common theme among certain small towns around the Appalachian region that are far, far out there. It almost gives me an Old West kind of vibe. But back to Minnie Sutton. As I mentioned, none of these stories can be found recorded online anywhere, other than in the two groups that I asked, so this is an oral-only story. A seven-year-old man named John Turner hollered at me, and he said he vividly remembered old Minnie, and he wanted to set the record straight about her. I'd asked him about the various stories that I'd heard, and he said every single one of them is true. She was never formally arrested or accused, but they're true. 
Mountain Maul, he says, was actually Minnie Sutton's daughter, who made moonshine in her, her mom's cabin. But he remembered old Minnie just as well, and he reported that she was in fact a murderer. It was told that she had caught a boyfriend of hers cheating, knocked him out in his sleep, and threw him on the railroad tracks, and she made it look like an accident. There's a little bit more to this story, but we'll leave that part out. It's a little NSFW. It was told that old Minnie lived in a shack above the railroad tracks on the side of a hill. When the railroad workers would come through doing work on the tracks, she would lure them up to her shack that had a dirt floor with offerings of food and a place to stay. She would stab them to death in their sleep and throw them in the river. Some of them were never found. Other stories about old Minnie's antics include two men that were robbed a bank in Newport and made their way to that section of Cock County, and they had went up into old Minnie's woods, and she shot them and buried their cash in her yard. One other tale claims that she was a cannibal that turned her victims into a super pie that she tried to serve to the local residents. That one is probably a little far-fetched, but in addition to the story, nonetheless. Mr. Turner reported that old Minnie was meaner than a striped snake, and that in her shack you could see daylight through the walls, and she had a dirt floor and nothing else in it. Minnie Sutton reportedly passed on from this life to give the next world some hell in 1969. She is recorded as being buried in Union Cemetery in Cock County. I could find no headstone or tombstone that had been recorded, and I could find no relation from her to popcorn. Minnie's story is but a small fraction of what went on in these far-out mountain towns where even the long arm of justice wouldn't go. Stories such as the Minnie Sutton and the mean old mountain woman are common in some parts of the South. Were they true? Who knows? We may never actually know if Minnie Sutton actually did kill people. Most of those stories probably died with their keepers. But let's move on to the next story. And I'd like to extend a thanks to Wesley Lee for letting me use this story. It is known as the horror in Jonesville, and it happened in Christmas Eve, 1930. Outside of the little sleepy town of Oliver Springs lies Jonesville, which really isn't even a town, it's just a passerby community. A lot of my family is from Oliver Springs, and they have been for the last 200 years. So to hear some of what my great-grandfather would have read in the news, it's pretty cool. So, this story begins with the subjects. Erastus Jett, known as Rassy, born in 1866, and Catherine Jett, born in 1869, were a married couple that lived in Jonesville along Old Harriman Highway 61, about seven miles west of the town of Oliver Springs. After spending the evening at a Jonesville, uh, Christmas tree event at the Jonesville Church, Erastus had been waiting on his wife to show up at the event, but when she didn't show up, he figured, well, it's cold outside. Maybe she didn't get out. Maybe I'll go home and check on her. He carried the Christmas gifts to his house, and when he entered the home, he called out for her. When he did not hear any reply back, he lit a candle and went through the house, and then he found his wife laying in the floor in a pool of her own blood. It appeared that her skull had been crushed and her throat had been slashed. In a matter of days, Sheriff W. W. Roberts would arrest Abe Lawson, who was 35 at the time, and Jim Dalton, who was 18. They had been hiding in an abandoned log cabin up on Walden's Ridge. How the sheriff found them is not known, but when he did find them, before he even told, the, told them the charges, Dalton pointed to Lawson and said, There's the feller you ought to arrest. He killed the old woman. Lawson accused Dalton. I found some blood on Dalton's shirt and a knife that had been hiding behind a plank with blood on it. It was believed that revenge was the motive for the killing, as the Jets had priorly had Lawson prosecuted on the charge of stealing a gun, for which he had been sentenced to work in a factory or do hard labor. Upon investigation of the murder, it was established that Catherine had been hit in the head three times with an axe, 
and she had had her throat slashed twice with a knife. At a hearing at the Jonesville Church, Dalton would take up a not guilty plea, while Lawson would waive his trial. Under oath, Dalton told of how Lawson admitted to the killing, claiming that he was at the Jets' house eating dinner when Catherine came inside carrying a pile of wood and began yelling at him. He further claimed that the old woman shot at him three times with an automatic weapon. Young Dalton further claimed that he was going to inform the authorities as soon as he could get away from law. On January 17th, Abe and Jim were among 16 other men who had managed to escape the county jail. They had managed to slip a block of wood between the gate and the wall so that the gate wouldn't close or lock all the way. They waited until the jailer and the other officers went to sleep before they made their break. They managed to get all the way across the Clinch River, but were among five caught at the Gallatin farm on the next day. On March 12, 1931, Abe would be sentenced to ride the lightning, and Jim Dalton was, was sentenced to 21 years as an accomplice to the murder. In July, they again escaped by sawing the bars out of the jail and the window. Abe would remain at large and uncaught until late August, when Lester Peace who was the jailer in Corbin, Kentucky, found them hiding in the Ellen and train yards up there. Lawson was apprehended and brought back to Kingston to stand trial. However, in a very shocking twist, the Supreme Court decided that the basis for these sentencing and the prosecution of these men was unfounded, as there was no record that dictated why the sheriff even went to that cabin, or even why he suspected those two boys in the first place. There was no record that showed which man committed the crime, as they each accused the other. Abe Lawson would be found not guilty and walked, with indications that Jim would be freed as well. Catherine's case would be unsolved for the remainder of Erastus' life, and unsolved still to this day. Erastus remarried a few years later, but he passed on in 1945. And it isn't presently known what actually happened to Abe Lawson or Jim Dalton either. There is no recorded death date and no recorded burial. Perhaps they changed their name, that, but that's another mystery. Perhaps it was mediocre police work that led to the dismissal of this case. Perhaps both of these men were truly innocent, and Catherine was just murdered by a, a random passerby psychopath who was on his way out somewhere else. We may never know the truth. That's all for today, folks. I hope you liked these couple of stories. Now... As I get more stories, I may make another one of these videos. So in the meantime, thank you guys for almost 3,000 subscribers. Not quite there yet, but we're almost there. Catch you next time.